19th century Europe, an age of political upheaval, industrial revolution, dramatic population growth, and above all, expansion. Expansion beyond the confines of an old continent to new worlds over the seas. To the South Pacific, explorers from Europe found instead of a southern continent strange new islands, among them in the south, New Zealand. A Dutchman, Abel Tasman, an Englishman, James Cook, a Frenchman, Dumont Duville, these men discovered and charted two large and beautiful islands. Tasman named them for his homeland. They made the first tentative contact with the indigenous Maori, a fierce and imposing race that had preceded them to New Zealand by a thousand years. The new land, though often hostile and forbidding, seemed full of promise. Promise to countless Europeans who followed. Explorers began to map the place and often painted what they saw. recorded an abundance of different life. Arrivals, still few in number, began to push further inland. The landscape began to acquire European names. A glacier was named after the Austrian emperor, Franz Joseph a lake after the English poet Coleridge, a harbour after the French king Louis Philippe. New Zealand had promise, and the rush by the great colonising powers of Europe was on. The British got there first, and New Zealand became a British colony. The settlers began to arrive. They came not only from Britain, but from all of Europe. The great emigrant drive out of Europe provided immigrants for a new land. Germany, Yugoslavia, Austria, Scandinavia, Italy, France. These places, through their people, left their mark on a country half a world away. The life was hard. The land proved difficult. For many, like the skilled woodsmen from Scandinavia brought to Hawke's Bay, it was a matter of clearing dense forest, 40 miles of it there before agriculture could begin. For the French, further south at Akaroa, it was no less easy. Arriving in 1840, the place did not seem at all attractive at first, but bleak and infertile. Melmosh was so disappointed, he took a deep and desperate vow that never till he had seen France again, would he trim his beard. This he did, years later, but by this time, his family had adapted to New Zealand. Upper Mootery was a German settlement. 120 years ago, the German settlers drained the swamps and cleared the bush to begin their farms. With them came the Lutheran missionaries and a Lutheran church was established. The church remains although largely remodelled in 1904. The bell, Anna, brought from Germany in 1860, still tolls on Sundays. The graveyard bears witness to the four generations that have farmed the valley since the first arrivals came. And the old barns and houses built from hand-hewn wood 
are testimony to the hard work of the settlers. Ted Egger's great-grandfather was from near Hanover. For Ted and his father, life is a little easier than it was for their ancestor, but they still maintain a tradition of self-sufficiency. Most of their farm machinery they make or adapt themselves, from hop fryers to currant pickers. The original settlers in Mootery brought with them hops and grapevines from home. The Eggers still grow hops. And each November, another Eggers machine plants tobacco. are an important new crop for the Eggers, one that has meant prosperity for this generation. Perhaps for them, the promise the new country held for their ancestors from Hanover has been fulfilled. The immigrants from Europe brought their cultures and lifestyles with them. Gilbert Mercier is a recent arrival in New Zealand, a first-generation settler. And he brings with him an important contribution. He has imported French baking to Wellington and before that to Auckland. He's undecided whether to stay in New Zealand. He considers himself French and European, just as the original settlers did. For him, the choice is less dramatic than it was for the pioneers, 12,000 miles away from home. But if he does decide to stay and make a future in New Zealand, he'll form another link in the long chain of European immigration.
Peter Kampenhout is also first generation. He has no doubts about his future. He's here to stay. Twelve years ago, aged 18, he arrived in New Zealand from Holland via Indonesia. With him, he had two suitcases and $25. This is now his own farm. It's a small holding, but he's managed to increase his milking herd from 65 to 90 cows. He had a long apprenticeship from farm labouring through to farm management before he was able to seize the opportunity to go it alone. At this stage, it's still very much a struggle to maintain profitability, but Peter is a resourceful and hard-working man. The Dutch are the most recent European immigrant group to arrive in New Zealand, the bulk of them landing in the early 1950s. They're also the largest, and they've brought a contribution of new energy and skills to New Zealand. Chi te lo ha permesso? Ma volevo sapere che se voi avete bisogno di me. Ti ringrazio tanto, non ho bisogno di nulla. Puoi andare. Va bene, va bene, va. Aspetta! Voglio avvisarti, e per l'ultima volta, che non voglio più essere seguito da te. Mi spiego? Me ne sono accorta ed ora basta, sono stufa! Fortunato, rincominciamo! Ma dove sei stata? Dimmi! Confessa! Come se la colpa tua fosse meno grave se tu avessi la forza di confessare. Dov'è il tuo amante? Parla! Ma tu sei pazzo! Io non ti conosco più! The Circolo Italiano fosters not only an interest in Italian theatre, but in all Italian culture and language. Gianna Desposito is a member of the Circolo, and although she speaks fluent Italian, she has never been to Italy. Her father arrived in New Zealand in 1953. They live in the largely Italian fishing community of Island Bay in New Zealand's capital, Wellington. Italians have established themselves in market gardening, fishing, and more recently, tunnel engineering. Occupations for the second generation are more diverse, like Shiana, who works for IBM. The Italian community in New Zealand is relatively small, numbering only a few thousand. Nevertheless, their efforts to retain a cultural identity are successful. They've been assisted by a more recent influx of several thousand Italian engineers and tunnelers under contract to build a massive hydroelectric project in the North Island. The lifestyles that the immigrants imported from Europe often had one thing in common, wine. French Catholic missionaries established the first major vineyard in New Zealand. Italians founded vineyards that still produce Chianti and Vermouth, 
and successive waves of Yugoslav immigrants set up scores of family vineyards that now produce wines of world class. After the Dutch, the Yugoslavs are the largest continental group in New Zealand, and while most of them are now urbanized, they're still best known for the orchards and vineyards they soon founded in the new land. Peter Babich is the manager of the now sizable family business of Babich Vineyards and his brother Joe is the winemaker. Their father, still active in the firm, founded it some ten years after his arrival in 1910, having worked in the interim digging for cowrie gum in the far north of New Zealand. Like other European groups, the exodus of settlers from Dalmatia was largely a result of chain migration, a continual flow of migrants over the years joining their New Zealand relatives. This constant renewal of contact with home has meant that people like the Babbages still retain elements of the lifestyle of Dalmatia while still involved in the mainstream of life in a new country.